years ago, Governor Walker promised us 250,000 jobs. That's a broken promise. We went from losing 133,000 jobs in the four years before I took office to gaining more than 100,000 jobs since. We are now just two weeks before residents across Wisconsin go to the polls and make their selections for governor, attorney general, and many others. Good morning and welcome to For the Record. I'm political reporter Jessica Arp in for Neil Heinen this week. It has been a week packed with political news and candidates starting to make their final pitches to voters. I want to build off those successes, put more money back in the hands of small business owners and help job creators build from the bottom up an organic economy that says you can do whatever you want to do. And the one thing that I would do that you had asked what specifically we would do that hasn't been done before is I will actually reduce the cost of college. Race back to a dead even tie. The latest numbers released Wednesday in Milwaukee show the race for governor in Wisconsin closer than ever. In the poll of 803 likely voters, Republican Governor Scott Walker and Democratic challenger Mary Burke are tied at 47 percent, with just 4 percent undecided. Exactly 380 people said they'd vote for each of the candidates. In four previous polls, the race has never been outside a five-point difference. So this variation is showing us that the turnout motivation and which groups are motivated to turn out in a particular time are really driving these shifts that are all pretty modest leads for one candidate or another. So we have, of course, a lot to talk about this week, and I am joined this morning for a political roundtable on this by former Democratic Attorney General Peg Lautenschlager and President of the Wisconsin Grocers Association and partner at the Capitol Group, Brandon Scholes. Thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So I have to start out with those poll numbers, a literal <laughs> dead heat in the governor's race. Did anyone think it would be this close at this point? Um, I was surprised by the fact that the numbers were exactly alike, and not just in the governor's race, but in the attorney general's race, which um, I don't think I've ever seen a poll where there wasn't at least one or two, uh, you know, questioners difference, um, right. even if they were statistically the same. Yeah. I think for most of the surveys that you've seen over the course of the political season back into the summer and moving forward now to the general, have shown the race close all the way along, and I don't think that's a surprise. Uh, to a lot of people that follow the race. I don't think anybody would see a big wide gap or a surge out. Wisconsin has, you know, now had, or is going to have its third election in, in four years, and voters are very attuned. Uh, so I, I don't think this is one of those elections where people wake up and go, oh, we have an election coming. I think they've, they've made up their minds early. And that small group of people in the center um, are still making up their minds. You see a little fluctuation, and as Professor Franklin said, you know, the base has caused some shift, uh, whether it's voter intensity, but not any big surge. I don't think it's a surprise. Yeah, what, I mean, the numbers in the polls showing some pretty significant fluctuations among independents. The last poll, I think we saw something like 13 point advantage among independents for Governor Walker. At this point, we see a one point advantage for Mary Burke, a pretty big swing, but I mean, what's, what do you think is really driving that? Uh, it's hard to say what exactly is driving it. Um, my sense is that there are people who are now seeing more of Mary Burke than they had before on the television. And te television commercials still have an incredible weight on, uh, on general voters uh, who, who come to the polls. So I think that her being up on the air more, her responding to some of the early accusations that were out there in terms of independent expenditures and the like are kind of bringing some people who consider themselves independent more toward the middle. And uh, so I guess I wasn't surprised to see it. I don't know what Brandon thinks. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, the Burke campaign and, and uh, Mary Burke's allies are spending more money on, on TV. Uh, and that's been a ramp up since Labor Day. Um, and I suspect as we go out through uh, Election Day, you're going to see that increase even more. But again, you're trying to massage a small group of people who, as we've seen in each of these polls, are very flexible. They're fluid. And so it, you know, it is going to be, I think, one of those campaigns to the end. The message that candidates are, be, are, are going to be able to deliver to these voters, in some cases in pinpoint delivery, maybe not necessarily on television. Who are these people that they're talking to? Who are to? these people? <laughs> <laughs> are they, right? The That's the question. question. And will they vote? Yeah. Yeah. And will they vote? My, my sense is, is that a lot of what you're seeing is women. I think that's why you've seen the softer ads from Walker and his proponents uh, when it comes to abortion rights and things like that, where they're kind of trying to 
you know, do something around the edges on those issues without changing position, softening their position some, because my guess is, is that uh, what you're seeing is, is a lot of women, particularly single women, moving to the Democratic side and moving toward Burke, and that's their effort to stop that. I don't quite agree, because I think in, in single uh, issue voters, in, in most cases, I think their minds are, are made up, um, probably already at this point. I, I sense that those independent voters, those ticket splitters, uh, the ones that go at the end have multiple issues that they're trying to, to balance out. Where are we on jobs? Where are we on Wisconsin? What's going to happen here? And maybe there's some outside influences, uh, political or other issues that tend to move them one way or another. So I, I think the single issue voters are, are fairly well settled out. It's those that have multiple issues that are still trying to sort through this race. We also saw some numbers about, I mean, who's saying that they're the likely voters now, right? I mean, right. We, we've seen pretty incredible enthusiasm among people who call themselves partisans in the race. But all of a sudden in this poll, we see this big jump up in the number of independents who actually say, yes, I am absolutely certain I'm going to vote on Election Day. Do you think that's going to materialize in two weeks, or does that sort of flow back down? You know, I think... Uh... You've seen some changes in this poll in terms of some other demographics and some other issues that, that had dramatic changes. So, uh, you know, I'll defer to Professor Franklin and, and his analysis of voter intensity. But what we do know is that the partisans are highly intensive. They are ready to vote. And now you have to go back and look at those folks who voted in 2010, in the recall in 2012, and, and in the presidential, and where do they come down in 2014, and whether that intensity still takes them to Election Day. And, and I think, too, that um, you, you see the kind of backlash from people being uh, feeling disenfranchised from both political parties, and so more people are willing to call themselves Democ or to call themselves independents now as compared to before. So I think that's part of what's going on in this mix. But clearly the notion of do the independents vote and who comes and turns out to vote, even among the partisans, is I think what's going to drive the election. Uh, you can look at the numbers um, uh, in terms of registered voters versus the likely voters, and um, those numbers are different and not surprisingly favor Democrats. Uh, so that, that whole GOTV, get out the vote thing is, I think, pretty much going to be what, it, what determines the course of the election. That's something we want to talk a lot more about. We have plenty more to talk about today, so we will be right back with more with our political roundtable. Welcome back this morning to For the Record. I am joined today by our political roundtable today, Brandon Scholes and Peg Lautenschlager, to talk some more politics this morning. So one thing you mentioned before we went uh, to the break there is this get out the vote effort. What can you tell us about what's really going on across the state, how each, each party is really trying to energize their voters? and what's going on to try to get them out in November? I mean, my sense is that both parties are taking kind of a multiple push approach in terms of, of getting out people. You're going to see independent expenditures that target people where you know that they care about a particular issue, something like that. Uh, I think you're seeing a lot of on the ground, boots on the ground, grassroots kind of stuff going on as well. I know um, I think the uh, Democrats have targeted leaning Democratic voters who probably voted in 12 and 08 but didn't vote in 2010, trying to identify those people, speak to them, talk about the importance of the election from their perspective. Um, you're seeing a lot of ads that are kind of going toward that middle ground, but trying to, um, I, th I think the, the kind of the really hard, nasty ads are kind of starting to fade away a little bit now where you're seeing more people trying to say this is why you need to vote uh, and making it a less onerous process than it sometimes seems. So I think, uh, you know, those are the kinds of efforts. And, and like I said earlier uh, in the previous segment, um, my sense is, is this is all about turnout. Yeah. What, what kind of efforts are the, is the state GOP really taking here? Well, I think one of the things you have to think about, and as we like to over-engineer poll results and just tear them apart, um, it goes much deeper than that because there are other polling operations out there and there are other, there's other intelligence that you get from, from different polls that, that people do. I think the sophistication, though, in voter turnout these days is substantially different than it has been in even recent elections. 
um, they will pinpoint their base. They will make sure they go. The refrain for the next two weeks is don't think that we've won this. I mean, that is, that is the death blow to any campaign who thinks we're fine. I don't think any campaign will be out there saying we're fine. They will push their base, they will reach that base and push them to elections and they will drive them to with as, you know, with as many uh, heads up calls and reminder calls as they can. But to get down to that segment of voters that couldn't make the difference. Those are pinpointed messages. Um, I, I think television has some impact as a reminder but less so of uh, as of a drive, and that drive will come directly from the candidates, candidate surrogates, candidate campaigns, party apparatus will play a role in that. But at this point, if party pol uh, partisans, are, are, you know, if the Republicans and Democrats who are, are identified, they self-identify that way. I mean, if they're not going to the polls, then a campaign's going to have a problem. So they, you know, they have this double challenge, this dual challenge drive their partisans, drive their base to the poll for a 100% turnout and pick up those either undecideds or those that have, that have tended to shift in the last couple of weeks for the campaign. So that, that's a lot of technology. That's a lot of social technology. It's a lot of phones. People could hate those phone calls for the last couple of weeks, <laughs> but it does reach people. It's, it's some direct mail. It's television. It's radio. It's one-on-one. -on -one, it's, it's, you know, individuals calling rather than robocalls. So you, you'll see everything done to turn people every stone will be unturned to make sure that if somebody wants to vote they're going to get turned out to vote so prepare for the dailies right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we we did see this week as well like a lot of news items besides the poll we saw some news late this week um, about the state budget that the state will end the year with a 517 million dollar surplus although that's 200 million dollars below what the projections are supposed to be a jobs report uh, out shows Wisconsin creating about 8,000 jobs last month um, and the un unemployment rate went down and then of course we have individual information about each one concerns from some liberal groups about donations that Governor Walker got from the insurance industry and in connections to his Medicaid decision and then emails showing Mary Burke's predecessors at the Department of Commerce maybe had some concerns about how her about her performance now you know as a news reporter we report all of these things and then things happen dynamically in the campaign I mean how do you think these news items sort of affect people's consciousness do they get in at this point well, I, I'd say welcome to the last two weeks of the campaign I mean you know this is this is gonna roll every day with something else that's released and I think, you know, from a campaign perspective, they have to worry that there's just information overload, that they've just flooded the channels and mm -hmm. there's too much out there. And will this particular issue or attack or revelation get traction? And, or will it just be pushed off into the next news cycle when something new comes up? So if there is a significant piece of information or news that is new and is relevant and has the ability to push voters, Campaigns will focus on that, and you may not see it above the radar. You may see it delivered to undecided voters and others in different means. So, you know, collectively, all of those things, it may be tough for people to absorb. It may be too much. But individually, those issues could be the turning point for somebody who is undecided. Yeah, I mean, do, do you have to stick with a clear a clear narrative that way? I think you do a clear narrative, but like, like Brandon alluded to, is that you've got all these independent expenditures out there, and as a result, they are picking up on narratives that are important to the folks who they want to get. And so um, sometimes those narratives, I think, kind of run counter to one another, but trying to keep it in the same direction. And it is a particular problem, because you generally have people on the partisan, the, the avid partisans who are going to vote or you want to drive to get to the polls who are a little are much more polarized than that middle group of independents and as a result of that um, trying to craft that message to keep the partisans fervor up and get them to the polls while at the same time doing something that's more middle ground and appealing to independents is sometimes a tough uh, you know, walk to take, and I think um, I, I think you see that as I mentioned earlier with the the, the abortion and the women's health care ads that are coming out now by by um, Governor Walker, where those who are so-called right to life, uh, the anti-abortion 
contingency are pretty much solidly in the in the camp of um, uh, of Governor Walker. You have people who call themselves pro-choice or are women's health advocates who are pretty much in the camp of Mary Burke. But in between are those people who really don't like abortion, but they're not sure that they want to be zealous about it and whatever. And so you see those ads now with those softer edges coming out on TV uh, discussing concerns about women's health or whatever. But um, So I think that's what you're seeing now is that wa trying to walk the walk to get those middle voters while at the same time making sure your partisans are still stoked up. So in a real quick, if you had to give, you know, each maybe a, a two-word answer, what's the message for each side? It, r real quickly before we go to break, two. What, uh, two or three words, what's the message for each <laughs> side then? I, I, think, I think that message is you have to focus, you have to target, and you have to reach out and turn. And, and turn meaning get them to the polls, but it's, it's really focusing uh, because you just, you know, in, in the past it'd be like, what's the October surprise going to be? I don't know that if in this campaign or others there's a big enough issue of, an, of a surprise that is launched in the last two weeks to really turn the race upside down. And if there is, it will make big news. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's get out the votes and real jobs. Yeah. Well, we want to talk some about the Attorney General's race, race as well, so we will be right back this morning with For the Record. that there is a law that directly conflicts and is blatantly unconstitutional, uh, there is an ethical duty not to defend that law. When you take the oath to defend the Constitution, you don't cross a couple of your fingers and say, except for these ones. Lots of news on the Attorney General front as well. Welcome back to For the Record. We're joined this morning by Brandon Scholes and Peg Lautenschlager for our political roundtable. We do want to talk about the AG's race, which just somehow sort of played second a lot <laughs> in the news coverage here. But uh, not as much focus here, but that, that poll out Wednesday showed that 75% of people don't know enough about these candidates to make an opinion. How did they connect in the next two weeks? You know, I, I, clearly to start your campaign with two weeks ago is very difficult. I don't think anybody suspected that the Attorney General's race would be high front and center, um, that people would get attention to it. But as I, I, we've said all along, this is a critical race. It's an important race. It could be a sleeper, and it, it could have a lot of impact post-election. But I don't think voters get that in mind. I, I think they have a hard time understanding what the Attorney General's race is all about, and unless you're able to get down to some basic programs, uh, it's tough to to do that in 30 seconds. And you know the clip that you just rolled, um, I, I do think that's a little bit above voters' heads. I mean, they want to know what the state's top cop is going to do on heroin and you know drugs and crimes and white collar crime and how they're going to you know defend Wisconsin in whatever case. That's a tough message to sell, especially when you have the governor's race just, you know, has a sphere over everything. But this has kind of been a focus, this issue of is the attorney general another branch of uh, another legislator, so to speak? Can they decide what you defend and, and not defend? As a former attorney general, can you say how you balance that yeah, when you had the option? I think it's been mischaracterized. First of all, I think the whole thing about the state's cop top top cop has been mischaracterized by all of us because the reality is is the attorney general has almost no criminal prosecutive authority. There are ways in which an attorney general can weigh in on criminal issues and, and have play an important role. But um, a lot of the job has to do with what's come up now, which is sort of defense of the state, state laws, advocating on behalf of the agencies of state government. I think the real issue here, though, isn't are you going to enforce these laws or aren't you? And that was actually very eloquently posed by Judge Posner in the voter ID case dissent, where he said if the state legislature decides it's banning witches, do we all need to start witch trials coming up? And there's something where you have have something you know that would be blatantly unconstitutional uh, but essentially the AG's role is one of judgment it's determining where you're going to draw the line between defending cases and not defending cases and that line needs to be drawn not in an ideological way but in a way that looks at the Constitution looks at prevailing law looks at what's going on and determine uh, whether or not um, you, you should move forward on a matter because there, there are enough matters out there everybody could stay busy 24 7 so there's a prioritization as well as this judgment thing that come into effect you look at 
victim, uh, uh, District Attorney Schimmel, for example, and there was this statement about interracial marriage. Well, if the legislature passed a law banning interracial marriage right now, would a state attorney general uh, defend that? Um, I would think there is no attorney general, probably anywhere in the country, that would defend a law like that right now. But so it's sort of that, that notion of where's your judgment, where are you going to draw the line, and do you owe it to the voters to let them know how you would do that? And I think that's very important. Do you disagree that it, it, this goes over people's heads? I think it goes over most people's heads, yes, because I, I think they don't care. I think there's a cynicism about government that's very tragic because when it comes to what the AG is doing in these matters, it, it makes a heck of a lot of difference in their lives, mm -hmm. a lot of regular people's lives. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that's important to the state bar, but to voters in general, they yeah. do want to know where you stand on, on legal issues, but issues that affect the populace, and where do you stand on drugs? So you see Brad Schimmel out there uh, talking about what he would do on domestic violence, what he would do on heroin, the position that he would like to see the state be tougher on. Um, and, and you know, I think that's what, what people are looking for. And whether it's not necessarily the top cop that they've got a 45 sidearm, you know, on their hip and they're walking around forcing the laws, but you have seen, you know, Attorney General Van Hollen take action in drug cases and other things. And, and I think as, as people learn a little bit more about the Attorney General, because it has been a low profile race. Um, there hasn't been much going on. Uh, Susan Happ had an issue early on after the primary in her campaign where she really had to, she was quiet for, for a couple of weeks. And so, you know, to try and get the intensity of both candidates up and to try and get them uh, in front of voters, it takes a lot of work when you're competing with the top of the ticket, the governor's race, and legislative races, competitive legislative races across the state. You're trying to, you're trying to tuck yourself in, and again, two candidates that didn't have a lot of name ID coming into this race. Right. And, well, you know, and, and as, as you say, you know, the, the thing with, say, drug cases, I mean, uh, whether Brad Schimmel wins or Susan Happ wins, the reality is, is either one of them will have done more drug cases in their respective district attorney's offices than they will ever do in the AG's office, than, than Jim Doyle and I and J.B. Van Hollen combined, probably. Um, but yet, on the other hand, people do want to know. They want to know, have you developed a heroin in initiative uh, that's multi-jurisdictional and also multi-agency uh, uh, in, in terms of nature, as Susan did. But they, they spend a lot of time and energy defending their records in terms of how they have conducted themselves as district attorney when indeed the job of attorney general is very different. Right. Well, covered a lot of ground here this morning. Thank you both for being here. We will be right back quickly with For the Record. My thanks to our guests this morning, Peg Lautenschlager and Brandon Scholes. Just two weeks to go until Election Day. Stay tuned to News 3 this week for more political news. Until then, have a great rest of your weekend, and we'll see you next week for For the Record.